It is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Valerie Fagin from Oakland, uh, who is uh, the most uh, cited uh, scientist, uh, certainly in New Zealand, and one of the most cited scientists worldwide, with the incredible H index of uh, 102 and uh, citations well over 120,000. Uh, Valerie is also well known for his uh, infectious enthusiasm and friendliness and uh, is easily approachable by anybody. And he also created, uh, uh, this would be correct to say, uh, the neuroepidemiology as a mainstream subspecialty in academic neurology, almost out of uh, nowhere. I'm not saying this to irritate other academics, of course there are a lot of others, but Valerie basically take it further and uh, promote it uh, to come to us uh, like uh, clinical neurologists to be interested in it and then use the material that uh, the group uh, has produced. And I had the good fortune of uh, being a friend and colleague and collaborate with Valerie on various productive projects. And I'm very grateful for all of them. Valerie, very good uh, afternoon to you in New Zealand, I take it. Thank you, Tisa. Good afternoon to you too. My first question, Valerie, as you know, uh, you are a great promoter of uh, brain health, uh, as long as I can remember. As you are aware, World Federation Neurology and uh, Movement Disorders Society are joining hands together to talk about Parkinson's disease. This is somewhat personally close to you. When we launch uh, the Global Burden Disease, Parkinson's Disease paper that Ray Dorsey and a couple of us uh, uh, the, the contributed, uh, we actually launched the Lancet Neurology first issue historically, first time outside London in Oakland. So you must be proud of that too. Yeah. So how, my question is, how excited are you to see that WFN and MDS uh, are celebrating World Brain Day in their very ambitious campaign, ending Parkinson's disease? Yes, this, um, I'm very excited about the World Brain Day. As you uh, certainly know, neurological disorders have recently become the leading cause of disability globally. With the lack of neurologists, accessibility of neurological services, and shortage of research funding being one of the key issues in many parts of the world, including developed countries like New Zealand, Australia, UK, the United States, uh, um, most part of the Western Europe and, of course, developing countries. Um, I really hope to see the decision makers in New Zealand and actually across the globe are fully behind this important campaign and will use it as the opportunity to promote better brain health locally and globally. The, you, you made a very important point, uh, Valerie. We talked about this uh, on multiple occasions. Uh, number of neurologists uh, that uh, this world needs uh, is grossly inadequate. Uh, you have done some mathematics and uh, the appropriate statistical calculations. Uh, can you comment on that? Uh, how can we address this uh, burning issue? Of course, we can't make neurologists overnight. Uh, uh, but it is uh, indeed necessary if this is the leading cause of uh, disability worldwide, second leading cause of death. Given that we are moving to therapeutic era, we need people, we need manpower or woman power, if you like. Uh, uh, the, we need uh, these uh, resources to address them. And the, this pandemic is reminding us uh, how critically important health is uh, for us uh, as humans uh, worldwide. Uh, my motto is that uh, suffering is universal as humans, whether you are in Sri Lanka, Russia, Australia, New Zealand, uh, it doesn't matter. Your suffering is basic human suffering. And if we say that uh, we have neurological disorders, brain disorders that cause leading cause of disability and second leading cause of death, uh, yet uh, we have uh, no neurologists in some countries, uh, some countries with uh, even lower number, you know this better than me, make a comment uh, and uh, elaborate on the question and uh, make some comments on solution also. Yes, I think it's easy to say that um, um, the number of neurologists need to be increased and accessibility of neurological services need to be much better and increase research funding um, 
sources and amount of money available for neurological research. But to make it all happen, um, the government officials, basically decision makers, need to listen what um, neurology experts are saying. And um, uh, I think the voice of the uh, World Federation of Neurology is extremely important. Um, and I hope they will listen and realize how important the issue of neurology is for the basically existence of the humans. Um, the burden of neurological disorders has been increased steadily over the last 30 years and it's going up uh, progressively at the much faster pay, pay, pace, pace than um, cardiovascular disorders. Um, and it's probably not surprising because a population is aging globally and therefore uh, neurological disorders disorders associated with the brain are getting priority or uh, getting more prominent place among all um, health conditions. Uh, we do really need uh, to attract decision makers' attention and actually do something uh, real to uh, tackle the problem of neurological disorders. I mean, I totally agree. I'm not saying this because I'm the current uh, global chair for World Brain Day campaign. I think World Brain Day campaign is of great importance. Uh, whatever the disease that we choose for a particular year, whoever the international association that we partner with for that particular year, it gives uh, all of us an opportunity, whether you are in Auckland, Christchurch, Melbourne, Sydney, Delhi, New York, uh, to raise the profile and get the attention from our policymakers and funders uh, that this cannot be done overnight. But uh, if we advocate now, hopefully in the coming years, uh, we would start uh, making some changes and it is really necessary. So thanks very much for the, those comments and let's hope our colleagues in New Zealand and Australia would rally around this World Brain Day campaign Visit Movement Disorder website. Uh, visit I, I can give you this, uh, an example of a neurology workforce in New Zealand, for example, mm -hmm. and we cited it in the Lancet Neurology. Mm -hmm. We are two-fold shortage of neurologists in New Zealand, and New That's Zealand right. is a developed country, mm -hmm. so you can imagine what's happening in less developed countries. Mm -hmm. The problem is really significant, really big. It, it has to be addressed by decision makers, by the governments. 100%. Uh, these are really guardians of human brain. And uh, we, on one hand, we say that this causes leading cause of disability that is crippling these countries' economies. Uh, on economies. On the other hand, uh, we are not letting these people being looked after or managed well and promote that uh, economy well. I think what we need to uh, convince our politicians and policymakers is the resources that they allocate for these matters uh, would give them dividends very quickly uh, yeah. in a short period of time, given the therapeutic era that we live in. I mean, headache disorders are the case in the example. If we, if we, if we promote education and resources, uh, they would save uh, unimaginable amount of money certainly New Zealand and Australia and the rest of the other parts of the world also. And then they can reinvest it into health of Absolutely. people. Absolutely. Yes. Valerie, let's change our tactics a little bit. You have an illustrious career. It's not easy to create an H index of 102. It's not easy to get people cite you over 100,000 times. And it's not easy for one to born in a non-English speaking country and then write well in English, English language and speak well in English language and then become uh, the editor-in-chief of a prestigious journal like Neuroepidemiology and uh, change the landscape of how we look at neurological disorders worldwide. And you are also a proud husband and father and you 
enjoy the rest of the other things uh, that life offer like any other human being. So let's go back to your childhood days. Uh, tell us uh, what uh, motivated you to pursue a career in medicine. Yeah, you know, my personal interest in neurological disorders uh, was sparked by the mystery of the brain that has always fascinated me from my early medical school years. And it's still fascinating me. It's still a black box in many respects. And during the last uh, two years of my medical school, I actually attended student neurology interest workshops run by prominent Russian neurologists. And then I graduated uh, when I graduated, I had no doubt about speciality to choose. I became a general neurologist and actually employ, enjoyed working as a practicing neurologist in the hospital and outpatient clinic for quite several years. But then uh, all of a sudden my father died. You yeah, can I believe. Yeah, of devastating stroke at the age of 58, very mm -hmm. young. Mm -hmm. He was a medical doctor and professor at the medical school I graduated from. Mm -hmm. So he was well aware about all the health issues. Mm -hmm. What he had was a just elevated blood pressure. Otherwise he was perfectly healthy. And actually this tragic event made me start thinking about stroke and how to avoid it. At that time, there was no much known about stroke epidemiology, risk factor, uh, prevention of stroke, and certainly not much about treatment. There was no treatment, effective treatment at that time. I'll stop you there for a pause. Uh, I'm sorry to hear this story, but uh, the, I'm also glad that rather than thinking with sadness, uh, you wanted to do something. On it. And you actually did. Uh, you came up uh, with a truckload of publications telling us that nearly 90% of strokes can be prevented. Yes. To the extent, having read those papers, when I was doing a ward round, I remember vividly telling my residents that uh, I feel like I am a failure. I could have stopped this patient coming and seeing me. You then went on to develop a fabulous award winning stroke riskometer, which is freely available for most parts of the world. Uh, including some video clips uh, uh, of stroke prevention also. Tell us a little bit more about stroke prevention and your contribution in this field. Yeah, as you said, theoretically, up to 90% of strokes can be avoided, but uh, practically, and we estimated it recently at the World Stroke Organization, about 50% of stroke can be really prevented by uh, some preventative strategies that have been summarized in the recent declaration of the World Stroke Organization led by Professor Michael Brainin. Mm -hmm. And those uh, um, strategies have been outlined in the Lancet Neurology uh, very recently, just um, a month ago. We um, believe that the, most of the attention and intervention should be placed on the population level, which is quite different from the current strategy for uh, stroke prevention, which is targeting high risk, primarily high risk cardiovascular risk people. I think uh, there are many um, disadvantages of that approach and one of them is quite evident that we are witnessing the increase in the stroke burden um, across virtually all countries in the world and what we are proposing in that declaration which has been approved and endorsed uh, by the board of directors of the world stroke organization is uh, quite game-changing um, strategies. Um, and if you would like, I can uh, go on uh, explaining this strategy if we have time. But in summary, it is a population-wide approach um, which have been shown effective in many studies, mm -hmm. uh, plus 
um, polypill strategy mm -hmm. um, uh, consisting of um, blood pressure lowering and statin medications in um, middle age people with increased risk of stroke, not high risk, just increased risk of stroke or cardiovascular disease, lifestyle intervention using uh, mobile technology, as you mentioned, endorsed stroke riskometer app, which we developed at um, Auckland University of Technology and translated into 17 languages and community health workers who should uh, facilitate all these activities on the individual level. We estimated with these strategies, we can cut stroke in half in a reasonably short period of time. I mean, the beauty of this is Valerie, when you get that done, you almost guaranteed to cut uh, chronic respiratory diseases, uh, chronic renal diseases, uh, diabetes, obesity, heart attacks, uh, possibly even dementia from similar number also. Even some types of cancer, mm -hmm. because many risk factors of stroke are shared by all these major non-communicable disorders. You are very mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. yeah. oh, brilliant. The changing the tax again, so you were happily working as a neurologist, uh, but then something happened. Uh, you had a turning point uh, in your life. Uh, yeah. I believe uh, this is uh, meeting Jack Vishant uh, and uh, Phil. I'll, 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 I'll listen to the story from you. Yeah. Okay. So um, while continuing to practice neurology, I entered the postgraduate program at the medical school in Russia, mm -hmm. completed master and then PhD degrees in neurology by studying stroke epidemiology. And I must admit, I was very lucky to have as my first academic teacher and mentor, Professor Yuri Nikitin, mm -hmm. who was one of the founders of cardiovascular disease epidemiology research in Russia. Mm -hmm. It is actually because of him that I got involved in the landmark um, WHO Monica program, as you know, the first largest international epidemiological study of stroke and myocardial infarction. And this study created uh, for me an opportunity to build up a collaboration with international researchers. Mm -hmm. uh, at that time in the Soviet Union, international uh, collaboration was very difficult to develop, especially for the junior researchers. Mm -hmm. And in 1991, I received the Fogarty International Award from the NIH mm -hmm. and spent almost five years working as a research fellow at Mayo Clinic, Rochester, Minnesota, mm -hmm. where luckily enough, I met Professor David Weavers, mm -hmm. an internationally renowned neurologist and stroke expert mm -hmm. who became my friend for life. Mm -hmm. Also working side by side with the founder of modern stroke epidemiology, Professor Jack Wiesnan, mm -hmm. as you mentioned, mm -hmm. whom I am really proud to consider my second teacher, mm -hmm. was an unforgettable experience. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, when I graduated, um, then I graduated um, after Mayo Clinic, a one year postgraduate course at Erasmus University, Rotterdam, Mm -hmm. and received Master of Science in Clinical Epidemiology degree, after which I worked for, I think, two years as a senior research fellow at the neurology department of the University of Utrecht, the Netherlands. It was mm -hmm. very uh, nice, very enriching experience. Mm -hmm. And in 1999, I received an invitation pro of professorial position at the University of Auckland and moved to New Zealand with my wife Tatiana and daughter Svetlana. Mm -hmm. And we became Kiwi um, and New Zealand is now our home. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, just to continue <laughs> to complete my description of my uh, research career, uh, in 2008, I moved from the University of Auckland um, to Auckland University of Technology, mm -hmm. 
to take up a professorial position and establish the National Institute for Stroke and Applied Neurosciences. Mm -hmm. I have been director of that institute since that time. And in 2009, I was approached by the Global Building of Disease Study executives to establish a GBD stroke panel of experts. Mm -hmm. And later on, several GBD neurology panels nowadays um, consisting of a, over 400 experts um, globally across more than 100 countries. Basically, since that time, 2009, I am very closely involved in the GBD projects and publications related to stroke and other neurological disorders. And um, this very um, valuable and enriching experience was culminate, culminated in 2018 when our Auckland University of Technology hosted the world first GBD and Lancet Neurology Global Brain Summit. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you, you know about that event. Mm -hmm. uh, the aim of that summit was to facilitate implementation of the GBD findings into practice across the globe. That's eventually the main mission of the GBD, to implement findings into practice. And that's what we are trying to achieve now. I mean, that meeting was uh, such a fantastic, uh, very warm event. Uh, although the day was cold, uh, there was a lot of collegiality and uh, there was a lot of academic firepower and uh, they intermingled basically with the United Nations. You had people from Africa, you had people from Asia, yes. uh, obviously Asia, Oceania. We had uh, Lancet Neurology Editor. Uh, the, uh, although it was just a day event, uh, you had Chris Murray. Uh, the, it, it, I think it's, it's an unforgettable experience uh, in my academic life, uh, to tell you the truth. And it, it was certainly a game changer. And the GBD work, uh, I mean, as I have been campaigning for this World Brain Day thing, every time when a different country approach me, it's a piece of cake. You go to GBD, you play with data, you get a sort of real estimation of the size of the problem that that, that country has. You can basically mesmerize them saying that this is a projected number of uh, this particular disorder in your country and this is the impact that it is having. Uh, I, think, I think they are such a wonderful work. Exactly, you are very right. And particularly the GBD um, estimates are particularly valuable for countries where no epidemiological studies on um, neurological or any kind of disorders have ever been done. And GBD methodology allows to approximate pretty much accurate estimates of the burden of virtually all known um, health conditions in any given country. And even now on subnational level, mm -hmm. it is um, absolutely marvelous project. I think it is, um, a Nobel Prize level <laughs> invention, if I may um, say, it is really very, very important project. And I'm very proud to be associated and closely involved in it. I, I totally agree, I totally agree. Valerie, the, my next question is, uh, obviously you have achieved a lot and you continue to deliver a lot of uh, translational game-changing things. You already mentioned a few things that losing your loved, beloved father at the age of 58 of him uh, would have been shocking for you. Uh, the, 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 tell, tell me about uh, some of the challenges that you face uh, uh, along this journey and uh, the, how did you overcome them so that uh, the idea of this question is uh, if a neurology trainee or a physician trainee or epidemiology trainee from anywhere in the world who might be watching this uh, video, hopefully take some lessons uh, out of that and uh, get encouraged to continue what they do rather than discourage. Because life is not uh, all hunky-dory or all rosy for any one of us. Yes, uh, it's a good question, Tisa. Um, I must admit I was very lucky. I did not have major 
obstacles uh, in my research career. Uh, the main probably was to be uh, uh, recognized and it's everyone's researcher dream to be uh, recognized and acknowledged. And I think the best way um, to get it is to be involved in really important studies um, and publications that could lead to changing practice. If you are involved or leading such studies, you have very good chance of being recognized. The other challenge, particularly for me, uh, given my origin, um, was that English was not my uh, mother language and I had to learn it and um, learn how to write um, proper um, research articles and uh, my working experience at Mayo Clinic and then training uh, at the um, Erasmus University Rotterdam was extremely helpful in this respect. And I must say that some um, people may believe that if you are not English speaking, then uh, you are kind of disadvantaged to get published in top uh, medical journals. I think it is an exaggeration. Um, of course, uh, language barrier is important, um, uh, barrier uh, to take over. You need to uh, have a pretty good common um, English and uh, good uh, writing skills, uh, but that's not the main problem. I'm, I think the main problem is to have a really good study very well designed study and then language would not be an issue in getting the study published in top medical journals. I agree. I remember uh, actually reading a, a Russian novel as a, it's not a novel, it's a Russian true story as a, the, I think I was about 11 or 12 years of age as I was growing up in rural Sri Lanka at that time. This was about uh, Alexei Meresiev uh, and Boris Palevoy was the author of that book, uh, reading about this Russian pilot and how determined and uh, uh, encouraged he was to fly back uh, without having his uh, distal ends of the feet. Yeah. I remember reading around that and then, gee, if he could do this, uh, there's nothing impossible for a yes. uh, human to do and language uh, should never be a barrier to bring yeah. it quality yeah. science, because uh, you are trying to add science to uh, build a better world and you are trying to sort out that puzzle and I 100% agree that your background of uh, non-English speaking should not deter you building an academic career, whatever the neurology subspecialty that uh, you wanted to choose. Uh, Valerie, the, the, we already mentioned that you are happily married and uh, you have a beautiful, wonderful daughter. Uh, and wonderful wife. Wonderful wife. Tatiana, uh, we married for 46 years. Can you imagine? <laughs> well done. Congratulations. Uh, and tell us, tell us about a uh, little bit uh, on life outside medicine and life outside uh, neuroepidemiology for our neighbors. Yes, uh, I don't have much time, I must admit, outside of um, work. And my work... Uh, does not end at 4 p.m. or 5 p.m. Um, uh, this is disadvantage um, of being a researcher for the family uh, because family has to sacrifice some of the time to spend with you. Um, and I really appreciate the support of my wife, particularly in um, helping me uh, to continue to be productive and working on the projects. Uh, for me, uh, working over hours is not an issue. I actually, I enjoy working. That's the work I enjoy doing. Uh, so working Sundays, 
Saturday or my time is not a problem. I really enjoy it. And um, I really appreciate the help and support of my wife and my family in, um, in, in allowing me to do that. Thank you. And you, you're true to yourself. Uh, I remember, I think we have been known each other for over 10 years now. Every time when I send an email, I get a reply straight back uh, within a within couple of hours. Uh, I can't think of any email that I sent to you that I did not get a reply. Yeah. I, I think it is very important. Um, now you are very well established professor and internationally recognized expert, but for uh, junior researchers, it is uh, very important to have a, um, a good support from a mentor. Mm -hmm. And that's what I am trying to uh, do in my institute. And uh, when I am approached by junior colleagues um, in New Zealand or from overseas, I always try to help them. I think it's very important and often um, junior researchers do not have that much support um, and a lot of time is lost for um, bureaucratic you know um, things which can be avoided if you would have a, a sufficient support from a recognized expert. Valerie this is you, you mentioned a very important point this is the overarching summary version that I'm hearing from all big dons uh, from all over the world during this series of interviews. When I ask from them, what do you think as the main contribution that you have given to this world? They think a little bit, uh, they pause a little bit, and then they say, I think this it is the amount of people that I trained or helped uh, to see them on their own, well established in their own institutions and contributing to humanity. Uh, is, uh, is giving me immense amount of satisfaction. I think that's how we continue to build a better world. And the other important thing is even during this pandemic, what I'm seeing this internet, through this international work is Valerie, if some of our political leaders felt that they would divide and conquer this world, uh, scientific community completely the opposite. Uh, we have basically break all barriers uh, and uh, the through internet uh, we are reaching far and wide uh, globally on one theme. We just wanted to promote uh, best brain health uh, and we just wanted to keep improving things uh, and keep doing the very best to our patients uh, in a cost-effective manner. I think GBD, neuroepidemiology work that you all have been doing is making this job uh, uh, as a matter of uh, super urgent uh, now to the extent I almost feel that it is now or never whether we have a pandemic or not, uh, we have our own pandemics to deal with, uh, increasing uh, agony of this neurological burden and disorders. And then uh, the runners or advocacy program combining things together. As you are probably well aware, the WFN is uh, helping to continue to foster global neurological alliance. Uh, where everything to do with uh, brain and nervous system, whether you are surgeon, psychiatrist, uh, neurologist, uh, neuroepidemiologist, movement disorders, headache, uh, peripheral nerve epilepsy. The Alliance basically promoting uh, everything with a single voice, uh, uh, trying to find solutions. I think we live in an unprecedented era, despite in the middle of a pandemic. I'm very optimistic that we can get this job done, hopefully during our lifetime. Any final comments uh, to uh, finish off this interview, Valerie. You, you're very right, Tisa. I think uh, the key point is to have uh, concerted uh, collaborative actions um, and action plan, realistic action plan, and then we can achieve the goal of reducing the burden of neurological disorders, as well as the burden of other health conditions. Uh, absolutely, cardiac, renal. Uh, and, and the other, other point that uh, I like to hear your comment uh, before we say goodbye to each other is, uh, I see an enormous opportunity out of this pandemic. Uh, 
the fact that uh, we can't do things that we love to do, such as visiting each other and traveling and having academic uh, connections and conversations. Uh, however, the virtual world has connected us even more closer. When I look at uh, the European Academy of Neurology conference that recently concluded virtual three, there were over 40,000 uh, attendants of that meeting. I don't think we have ever seen 40,000 neurologists attending a single conference ever. And uh, I see an opportunity. Perhaps uh, we should set up a virtual GBD summit uh, from Auckland once again, hopefully soon. Yes, I, I, I think this um, uh, unfortunate epidemic of COVID-19 brought up some good solutions which we should apply to other uh, health problems, um, including neurological disorders, virtual um, conferences, web seminars um, becoming now part of um, virtually all uh, international conference. And I think in the future, there will be a hybrid of face-to-face uh, -face and virtual um, meetings. My, 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 my suggestion is, Valerie, we should, the, the reason that European Academy of Neurology was so uh, successful in my mind uh, is uh, because it is available for free. Uh, I remember growing up in rural Sri Lanka. Yes. have uh, 10 rupees, which is like, uh, five cents in New Zealand, Australia at that time was a big deal. And uh, the, the, the imagine that, uh, that that sort of a person trying to pay even $100 uh, for registration may not be easy. Yeah. Uh, therefore, I think making certain components uh, freely available, we have basically made education equal right across the world. Uh, of course, there are business aspects of many things, uh, but so I think uh, I think things like education and knowledge uh, we have to make them universal, available, just on behalf of humanity. Absolutely, absolutely agree. And uh, the I think uh, the, the 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 yes, it is tough times, but uh, both of us are very optimistic, uh, and uh, both of us work very hard. Uh, we don't have uh, work hours as such. Uh, and thank you very much for sharing up close uh, personal details with us. Uh, and I hope uh, the story that uh, we shared uh, about uh, Professor Valerie Pagin and his happy family life uh, and his uh, work ethics and contributions uh, and some of the stories uh, hopefully would inspire some of the folks uh, out there. And we would see uh, many more Valerie Pagins to come up from different parts of the world. <laughs> the legacy will continue to flourish uh, humanity and support humanity. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you, Tisa. My pleasure. Thank you. Stay well and my kindest regards to Satyan and uh, the, the, the. Thank the, you, I will. Also. Take care. Thank you.